Uh, my name is Robin Craig. I'm the William H. Leary Professor of Law at the College of Law and one of the faculty affili affiliated with the Wallace Stegner Center. So on behalf of that center and the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law, I'd like to welcome you to the second day of our 19th annual Stegner Symposium. Uh, on the national parks. I, before I introduce this morning's first speaker, I'd like to thank our donors uh, for their support of this symposium. First, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, which was a founding donor and has been providing principal funding for the symposium since 1996. The Cultural Vision Fund, which uh, provides support for a variety of Stegner Center activities. Uh, including this symposium, our Young Scholar Program, and our lecture series. And our sponsors for the symposium, the S.J. and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the American Bar Association's Section on Environment, Energy, and Resources. Uh, out of respect for our wonderful speakers to come, I'm also going to request that everybody take a second to turn off their cell phones or put them on vibrate. And as you're doing that, I will introduce our first speaker. Uh, I'm keeping our introductions brief. There is a full bio in the uh, pamphlet for this symposium. Uh, but Healy Hamilton is the Chief Science of Nature Service, or Nature Serve, sorry. And she will be speaking on climate change and resource management in the parks. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it to day number two. It's a good thing that I'm going on the morning of the second day because I am going to challenge you. Climate change, we heard so much about it yesterday. I think almost every single talk discussed the topic of climate change and the potential impact that it could have on parks and natural resources actually throughout our country and in fact throughout the world. I'm not gonna give you an overview. I am going to essentially have you hold on to your seats because we are going to think like a manager. What is it like to be a manager in a national park facing the issue of how do I understand what my park's future looks like. That means we're gonna dive into downscaled climate models and how parks, a park manager might actually look at climate data to try to understand, you know, what do I restore? How do I change my management activities? Because these are, in fact, questions that park managers are facing and climate change is a complex topic that they have to uh, address. So we're gonna think like a manager. The first thing I want to say is the National Park Service is hardly on the sidelines of this issue. There are a whole lot of efforts that are going on that are incredibly commendable in the national parks. Lee Welling is in charge of the Climate Change Response Program for the National Park Service, and she and her team are working incredibly hard and aggressively to help all parks across our country deal with the concept of climate change and what it means in reality for parks on the ground. And so they are absolutely to be um, celebrated and they offer, I think across all of the agencies in the government, they offer a leadership role in how are we confronting climate change. Um, however, there's still a lot left to do. If you think like a manager, these are some of the questions that you might be facing. I mean, basic questions like, how's the future climate in my park going to be different from the historical climate, the historical patterns to which my current management activities are adapted? Is there already a signal of climate change? And if there is, what's the spatial nature of it? What's the temporal nature? Which variables are changing? What months are they changing the most? You want to understand how do current trends in climate compare to historical variability, which is high. Inevitably, we, you know, climate is variable. It's very hard to tease apart the signal from the noise. How do we do that? We want to understand if there is a signal of current climate change, how do future models relate to current signals? Is there a way that we can take our understanding of how the climate is currently changing and use that to make uh, better choices about what future projection data we use in our decisions? And importantly, it's this, is this concept of climate refugia. Is there, are there places on the ground where the climate is already, where, where the topography or um, this area is actually resistant 
to the pervasive effect, effects of climate change? Are, are there areas that we should be considering as climate refugia? And if so, those become a priority for our, our management for persistence. What data do we use to understand how the climate is changing? Here is the distribution of, of temperature weather stations across our country from the National Climate Data Center. Here's the distribution of precipitation weather stations. These are our primary uh, observation data of what climate is supposed to be like. And what those tell us, looking at this um, curve of climate over time, this is the average across the whole lower 48, where we see on a yearly basis, the blue line, it just bounces all over the place. The five-year sort of rolling average is the red line. So this is the naturally variable climate that we are confronting. And one of the most um, challenging issues for trying to understand is the climate changing, because it's already naturally so variable. Um, so we take weather station data, which um, because we, we don't want to look just at those little dots. We need to understand how is the climate changing across a park. So in order to do that, we take the weather station data and we interpolate it. That is, we want a continuous surface where in every little grid cell, we have a value for, say, January minimum temperature for a certain year, or August precipitation for a different year. So the data that I will present today for the current climate is from a data set called PRISM, which is generated by, the university, by Oregon State University. It, it interpolates the weather station data so that Every little grid cell, it's offered at two resolutions, 800 meter and four kilometers. So those are squares where we have a spatial surface of values that tell us about climate from 1895 to the present day. Um, sorry, that's not on here. It goes for over 116 years. And this is, in fact, the official climatology of the US Department of Agriculture. So this is a widely used data set. For the future, we have to use global climate models that are trying to capture the energy flow of the entire global climate system. This is an incredibly challenging endeavor. And in those cases, the grid cells, where we look at how future climates are, are extremely coarse. Um, these are complicated models with dozens and dozens of variables that are run on supercomputers. Um, and then we take information from those climate models to assess the impacts. For example, the last Global Ch Climate Change Research Program of the US report looks at the impacts of future climate change by consuming information from climate models. So there are 28 different climate models that have been produced for the last assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it gets worse because every one of these 28 models has been run under alternative possible future conditions for how humans will behave on the planet in emitting greenhouse gases. So these 28 models have been run under different scenarios of the future, producing about 108 different futures that a manager would have to choose from to begin to understand what does the future climate hold for my park. A very daunting task. We're going to use a spatial climate data set for the future that's called Climate Western North America that was published in 2012. It's taken climate model data and got through a process called downscaling, has created finer resolution information. So we have two data sets, one for the current and one for the future. There's about seven or eight climate models available in this particular data set. So what does a park manager do? One of the first things, so we're going to take you to the heart of um, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Our examples will be about Greater Yellowstone, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and Yellowstone National Park. What I'm showing you here is where do we already have the most protected areas in this system? So the dark green areas are the most highly protected, where we let ecological processes unfold. The green areas, like forest service areas, are where we are actively managing the parks, but they are, excuse me, not the parks, actively managing our public lands, but we are still not, um, but they're, so they're, we use them, but they are also protected. So these are sort of the, the heart of our protected areas in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So if you're a manager in Yellowstone National Park, one of the most basic things you might do is called the delta approach, where we take a few versions of the future, we average them together, 
and we look at what is the degree of change from a baseline to the future. So in this case, our baseline is 30 years in the 20th century, 1961 to 1990. Here we've averaged about six different models together, and we're looking at what those models collectively uh, say about the future of precipitation across the year in Yellowstone National Park. This is the ratio of change from the baseline to the future under a scenario of higher greenhouse gas emissions and lower greenhouse gas emissions, which basically says it's going to get wetter. That's what it tells. The, it's going to get a little wetter. The models say it's going to get a little wetter. The ratio is maybe 2 to 10 percent wetter across the year. So if you're a manager, maybe that's not the OK, it's going to get a little wetter. That's what the models say. Let's break it down by month. Okay, we could at least break it down by month. Now we've just chosen one emission scenario, and we're looking at January, February, March, April. The ratio of change from an average of models from the future, the mid-century future, versus a 20th century baseline. So, okay, it's going to actually get wetter in winter, but drier in summer. That's a little bit more information to work with. But how do we know when we average those models together that those are the right models to choose? Is this the right emission scenario? Is this the right baseline? These are so many questions that you ask yourself when you're trying to understand what the future holds that that uncertainty can convey almost a sense of paralysis. We need to be able to get beyond that. We talked over and over yesterday about how we need to sort of take charge and get out ahead of global change. To do that, we need more and better information. Here's the future of annual maximum temperature change under a high or low emission scenario. Not, okay, it's going to get hotter. Somewhere between 2 and 2.5 two and degrees hotter when you average all these models together. Across the months, it's going to get hotter across the months. It's not a whole lot of information if you are a Yellowstone manager trying to decide what to do. It's going to get more hotter in summer than winter, according to this average of models. But let's look at the information that we already have. This is an animation of the history of weather stations in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And look carefully around the late 40s to early 50s, where we get a whole lot more information. This is our best understanding of how climate, what, what our baseline climate is and how climate is already changing. So far, we aren't really using information about how the climate is already changing to help us understand more about better use of climate models. So I want to talk about how do we analyze the trends we're already seeing to help us better inform how do we use future models to reduce that uncertainty and move towards more management action. So those weather stations tell us, here's our baseline pattern from 1900 to 1980, sort of before a signal of human-induced climate change was around, we're looking at the pattern of maximum temperatures in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem from January through to December, from very cold to much warmer. This is essentially the climate our management activities are tuned to. This is our baseline. It's a pattern that shows the effect of topography on climate, for example. Here's our baseline for minimum temperatures, cold in the winter, warmer in the summer, again, a, a strong effect of topography. And here is our baseline of precipitation, higher precipitation in the mountains, drier in the summertime. These are the climates to which biodiversity and our management plans are generally adapted, our 20th century baseline. We want to understand, have we already seen changes? If so, can we identify the nature of those changes? And can that help us more aggressively pursue management activities that reflect changes we're already seeing to reduce that uncertainty of forecasting into the future. So what we're going to do is take this entire time series and so extract for every single pixel, this analysis is at 800 meters, so less than one kilometer square, we have a value for every single pixel. We're taking this whole time series and dividing it up into a baseline from 1900 1980, and then asking, what's happening in the last 30 years? So we'll have a, a comparison, sort of the distribution of values over 80 years, and the distribution of values over the last 30 years. And we're going to compare those two together, right? compare them against each other, 
to come up with something that we're calling a novelty percentile. How different is the current from the, from the baseline? In fact, what percentage of values uh, in the baseline are different from those in the recent. So this is what it looks like for precipitation. Here, um, this would be, uh, this is increasing precipitation or decreasing precipitation. And again, we're looking across all the months. So this is the spatial distribution of change beyond historical variability. We're looking at, again, January through December. And the way you would read this is that if you have a dark green, 100% of the values in the recent exceed any value in the baseline. It's a trend in a direction. It's change beyond natural variability. So for example, you can see that in the north, in April, we have maybe 80 to 90% of the values that have occurred in the last 30 years. Um, excuse me. The values that have occurred in the last 30 years are higher in precipitation in these green areas than 80 or 90% of the values that happened in the previous 80. We are seeing a change that we can detect. Here's what it looks like for maximum temperature. Look at March. We are seeing values in the last 30 years that are much higher than the vast majority of values that occurred in the previous 80. Here's what it looks like for minimum temperature, our most dramatically changing climate, that the climate variable that we have values in some cases, for example, in July in the south, this bright red, this means that the last 30 years is exceeding any value that occurred from 1900 to 1980. That is directional significant climate change. So we're just trying to ask, what is the spatial and temporal nature of climate change that we are already seeing? And how can that help us sort of break the grip of uncertainty and move forward with uh, how we need to be changing our management activities? And thinking at this scale is going to help the, the Yellowstone National Park think about talking to its neighbors. How do we interact with the Forest Service, with the BLM, with our private landowners in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? If we have this kind of information, we can share with them, this is what's happening right now if you had a weather station that you were analyzing in your own backyard. It's not about the future. It's not about projections. This is relative. This is certainty in how the climate is changing. So I want to take you on a little bit more statistically rigorous approach. Um, hold on. This, this now is trying to get at specific statistically significant climate change and to summarize a lot of information in a single slide. Here we've now gone to just 1950 to 2012. We're asking what is statistically significant climate change over those 60 years where we have the very most weather station data, where we have the most reliable record, the most dense record of weather stations. This is January through December, and now we're asking, what is the elevational influence of climate change? So every one of these is a 100-meter bin, where we've averaged all the pixels in the greater Yellowstone by elevation, from 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters. Every one of these pixels says, what is the change in precipitation for that month at that elevation across every year, 1950 to 2012? So here we see, for example, October high elevations, increasing precipitation, not as much of a signal at the lower elevations. Lower elevations are seeing increasing precip in April. Over here then, we ask, what is the chance that we could um, see that pattern just r randomly? What is the, uh, this tells us what is the possibility that what we're seeing cannot be explained by any other method, so the statistical significance. So all of the changes across all these months at all these elevations, it's the April, temp April precipitation increase at low elevation and the October increase at high elevation that there's no way it could be happening by chance. The darker the value, the more impossible it would be to have that happen by chance. Here's the maximum temperature values. Again, January through December, 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters. We're seeing extreme changes in March maximum temperature. Look at this black bar. Every single elevation, there is no way that the changes we're seeing in March over this time frame from 1950 to 2012 can be explained 
by chance. It is a statistically significant trend. Minimum temperatures are the most dramatic signal of current climate change in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, across all elevations in the spring, we are seeing dramatically increasing minimum temperatures that cannot be explained by chance. So these are the kinds of patterns that we can use to communicate to one another, to help those partnerships understand what is the current pattern that we're already seeing. I mean, anecdotally, if you're in your backyard, you're seeing a lot of this. We tell stories to one another about how things are changing. This is the attempt to use the data that we have to statistically analyze it, to sort of jumpstart that conversation with some certainty about what's happening. Now what we're gonna try to do is add all of that statistical significance up to come up with a stress index. This is a weighted index for how much change are we seeing, where the darker purple to black is where many months and many variables are statistically significantly changing. The lighter blue to lower green, that's where we're seeing the least amount of significant climate change. This is a map of hot spots of climate change and areas that are acting as refuges, areas that are resisting the trends that we are already seeing. So for example, this Absorca Beartooth Wilderness Area, this area is be acting at least across this 62 year period, it's acting today as a refuge, resisting those trends that we saw earlier. So I, I believe that analyzing current trends in what we call climate space can really help inform this conversation with our partners across park boundaries to the Forest Service, to the BLM, to our, our partners in, uh, in the open space districts, uh, in, in the land conservation areas. These are conversations that we have to have with an understanding of what is already occurring in our landscape. So I'm gonna pass through how we use these to, um, to, exam to basically filter current climate change to better project future models. And I wanna talk about scaling up then, right? The greater Yellowstone ecosystem is just a part of a larger landscape. This is the southern end of the Yellowstone to Yukon. Yellowstone to Yukon is a larger landscape still where we're just anchoring here at the south. This is a, a data set suggesting that the northern areas in summer are gonna get wetter and this, the drier areas down are gonna be down in the south. But we need these landscape scale patterns of climate change in order to have the conversations across the partnerships that we talked about building yesterday. So I wanna move to closing by talking about the role of the Park Service in this. We talked a little bit yesterday about Director Jarvis's call to action. Call to action item number 22 is called scaling up. Uh, I had the, the privilege of being able to interact with a lot of the senior leaders at the Park Service over a scaling up workshop. But what does it mean to scale up? What is the role of the National Park Service in large landscape conservation? How are we gonna manage the natural and cultural resources in the face of climate change to increase resilience, right? What kind of science do we need to cultivate so that we can have these conversations? How do we collaborate with other land managers? All of these are factors that are essential for scaling up. I think that without some kind of unifying spatial data sets that, help, that, that provide sort of a green print for what we are trying to achieve, it becomes, it's hard to have those conversations. This is uh, the California Essential Habitat Connectivity Project, uh, an effort actually from the Department of Transportation to produce essentially a green print of what large natural blocks we have in California and where are our priority areas for establishing connectivity. This doesn't include any kind of, of analysis whatsoever about climate change. So imagine that we sort of intersected, we provided a filter of how climate change would influence the decisions about where these corridors should be. That these kinds of common spatial data layers are essential for our ability to hold the conversations that we need across those very diverse sets of partnerships where we have the tribes and and the land trusts. In fact, yesterday I was talking to a friend of Bob Kiter's, Terry Marbach here, in the, uh, Marbach, here in the audience, 
who's part of a land trust alliance in his area in southern Indiana. And I said, oh, how fantastic. That means you're figuring out which lands you need to build connectivity and filling in the gaps and putting together this green print. And he said, actually, we're not. We don't have one. And we can't afford that kind of um, lack of information anymore. So I sincerely believe that climate change resilience, the green print of connectivity that needs to be built to create that resilience, has to happen in a conversation where we are looking together at common spatial data layers that help us visualize the changes that we are already seeing, that we're using those changes to filter all the different possible futures so that we can aggressively look to future projections that we're more confident about. And in fact, the National Park Service already has built the base of these common spatial data layers to, to encourage this conversation. MPScape is, in fact, a, a system more built for internal audiences, but I think that could serve to encourage this conversation. So I encourage you to visit MPScape, which has a lot of fantastic spatial data layers already built on it. So, Wallace Stegner's vision of the American West had, it was inextricable with humans. Humans were part of the character of the, of the West that we knew. And I would say we are entering a time where that, will, that has never been more true. It's going to be up to us to determine what kinds of forested ecosystems, what kinds of grassland ecosystems. The species are not going to stay the same. Biodiversity is responding to global change, such as climate change. We're going to see the stage here of the American West with the actors actively changing. And it's going to be up to us and the conversations that we have together to determine how much change, who those actors are. And I believe the National Park Service has an essential role as a, a leader in convening the conversation about shaping the nature of the American West. Thank you so much. Do we have time for any questions? One question? Yes, sir. So it's a very impressive data set. And my question is whether there's similar analyses have been done for other parts of the country. Because my sense is that Yellowstone, with its high elevation, ample rainfall and so forth, mm -hmm. is not as vulnerable as, say, our southern Utah parks, mm -hmm. where it's probably rainfall and drought rather than temperature changes or some other critical parameter that are going to be uh, you know, more important for vulnerability. So I did this analysis for this talk. And I have not, and we are still working on generating this idea of a climate stress index. That was for that 62 year period. My next effort with my lab is to um, do a sensitivity analysis of if you did 1940 to 2012, 1930 to 2012, right? What kinds of changes would you see? So we're still very much in the formulation stage of how do you identify this climate stress index? How do you determine these refuges? And uh, of course, I'm hardly the only research group working on this. There are a lot of very smart people, a little bit more focused on future climate projections. I'm a little more focused on trying to understand climate change that we've already seen. But you're right, the topographic complexity of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem may lend it some inherent resiliency to climate change that areas of southern Utah may not experience. And I look forward to doing that analysis at my first opportunity. Yes, sir. So um, you invoke Stegner, and it seems to me there's a big gap between the advanced science and statistics that you've so nicely presented. And Stegner, he's a writer, and yes. he isn't part of this communication and dialogue you're calling for. Might it not involve getting more Stegners, more Stephen Trimble's people can actually take what you're saying and communicate it to a broader world? Um, it seems like maybe you're, even when you told us, hold on, that's a warning to a group of people who already probably have the confidence to understand this statistics you're talking about. Yeah, I think people can't hear you. So I'll repeat, I'll, I'll repeat. Um, so um, the question is, ha we have an F we need to make an effort to communicate this to audiences beyond the audience in this room. And that Stegner, as, an, as a writer, 
um, is all, you know, even when I said, hold on, because I'm going to take you through this data intensive talk, that that's a bit of a warning that might even shy people away from this conversation that we have to have. And of course, we talked about all, there are many different audiences that have to be part of this conversation. My emphasis was on uh, how do we start this conversation by having common pictures that we can relate to. I'm, and and I, I truly believe that in a way, a map does tell a story. And that if I had more time, right, I could go slower and tell you more, you know, we could have more background and, and we, ha we have to take the time to have this conversation. It's not a 20 minute talk. I agree that we need more writers. Um, my dear friend Mary Ellen Hannibal just wrote a book about the spine of the continent where she does an incredible job digesting the science and encouraging the conversation. So yes, I, I believe in those partnerships, but I do really believe in the, pos in, in the capacity of spatial data appropriately displayed to actually tell a story that everyone can come together at the table, understand, and then we can move forward from there. And so, yes, we need writers, but yes, we need maps too. Yes, we need them both. Yeah, that's, okay, and I'll, I'll be around, I'm happy to, talk to anyone else. Thank you very much. Yeah, unfortunately we need to keep going. So